Although the political system of apartheid officially came to an end in 1994, we're here to find out to what extent racial segregation still exists in South Africa. My name is Vusumzi Mkongo. I'm an ex-prisoner here uh, on Roman Island. I was an activist uh, during apartheid era. I was a student. I revolted against the status quo because of its laws that is not, uh, was not good uh, for our people. Uh, there's not much that has been changed, but uh, we are still going towards that. Because we must recall that we did not achieve our, our economical freedom. We only achieved political freedom. In post-apartheid South Africa, do you still experience uh, racism? And if so, to what extent? And as far as racial segregation, how much of it do you see on a day-to-day -day basis? Okay. I'm going to speak mostly of Cape Town, which is where I live, and you know, I my experiences are here, so I'll speak for that. Um, Cape Town itself is a city of just many different cultures, right? Uh, the true inhabitants of this area are the Khoisan and the Tosa people. Um, during apartheid times, those people were forced into, you know, informal settlements, at, you know, in a very different side of town. Um, very much of, you know, the luxurious uh, places in Cape Town are all Jewish owned. So they've also got their areas, and then obviously you've got the coloured, which are the mixed race people, maybe a mix of black and white or or whatever. They're more in the middle, in the, you know, if if Cape Town was from that end to that end, so you've got the white people on this section, you've got the um, colour people in the middle, and then you've got the black people right at the bottom Sounds of the food chain. And it still very much is like that. I realise that even you know in most places that you go to, and I'm sure you're travelling Cape Town, so you know you've been to certain areas, you find places like Camps Bay and Clifton are more, you know, they they're more predominantly white. And when you're there as a black person you know, you are a minority and you do feel it and sometimes are made to feel it in a certain way, either because maybe you're not behaving in a certain type of way or they just, you know, just not used to, you know, the whole mix. I remember there was an ad in the paper about how um, our beaches in Cape Town are still predominantly white and that a lot of black people actually, you know, even though they might want to, don't end up, you know, at these beaches because then you know you, you stick out and um, without I, I think it's very subtle I think it's very subtle racism there's certainly geographical separation um, in terms of as in terms of segregation so uh, if you look at Cape Town just geographically you know there's a large concentration of white people in the city center and the wealthy suburbs and blacks and colored people are, tend to be pushed to the outskirts um, and so just that geographical separation is a form of, of oppression of black people um, and that's not even to mention how difficult it is to be a black person just from um, the way that people are used to treating black people. So I think in both of those senses, South Africa is a racist place. Um, there's also people that are explicitly racist in the sense that, I don't know, they feel white people are a superior race, but that's, that's an extreme form of thought and that's by no means common at all in South Africa. I think the ANC is still like, driving diversity in South Africa. I mean, look at the recent party that they held for their, I think it was 130 year uh, existence here. And then they actually like tried to drive the spirit of Jan van Riebeek from the stadium because as they, they said that's when all South Africa's problems started, but that was in six, the 1600s. And even then, that's so, only when development came to South Africa. Exactly, so I think like, like, the ANC is still playing that card because that's the only card they have left to play is the racism card. 
So they're still trying to get that vote from the, the racist point of view, saying that if you don't vote for us, you know, you run the risk of going back to the apartheid era. So, which is not true, but that's the part that they're playing. That's a strong. Yeah. So, you know what, I think, I'm not trying to be racist, but I think in a large part, they're still responsible for the racial tension that is still happening in South Africa at this point. So, So this is the home, this is a, that's how people stay, this is the reality. They are all on the waiting list of government that is giving low-cost housing to the people. More than 16 years they've been staying here. So how many people stay in this room? Six people. Mother of house. On top of that, she struggled to work because she's got a polio. And also, uh, she stays with a grandson of seven months old. Even Johannesburg and Cape Town have very different social dynamics, you know, whereas I feel like in Joburg you see everyone everywhere. You see like different races on every social class, you know, so like, that guy would be a taxi driver, but he would also be the guy in like an SLK, you know, whereas in Cape Town I feel like it's still very institutionalized in the sense that the spaces in Cape Town are still designed in a way where black people are here and white people are there and colored people are there okay. and Indian people are there and even when you go out in Cape Town So would you say, do you see uh, mixed couples and mixed... Uh, I would think you see a lot more uh, of them yeah. in Cape Town than yeah, in Johannesburg. Yeah, I noticed that, that more down here in Cape Town. Yeah, the mixed race thing. Yeah, but yeah, mm. couples. But I find that then the guys or the couples are like from Europe with like an yeah. African person. I don't, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I think that's uncommon. Afrikaans that people happen? still, I think, often keep to themselves. Okay. Yeah. Um, what's what's your background? My family is half Afrikaans, half British. So they did with us. <laughs> <laughs> but not with. Yeah, I know. I, I know. Yeah. 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 Pretty much the same. It's only been a period of about twenty years now, and you know. I think people should realize that 20 years is actually a short time in the greater scheme of things. And I say that because you know, a lot hasn't changed for a lot of people. These days, in a lot of the black communities, you hear people saying things like, you know, even radical statements like, you know, things were better for us during apartheid times because the government's failing us, at least we at least we had, you know, basic commodities and things like that. A very interesting thing that I mentioned to Claire actually the other day, like um, when we heard about this, is I remember being in grade one in 1994 and our teacher came into the class the one day and she took off the old flag off the wall and she put a new one on the wall and she was like, oh, kids, Today our country has become a democracy. This is our new flag for the Rainbow Nation and everything. Obviously, as kids, we didn't really think anything about it. Too. It was yeah. like, oh, okay, cool. But looking back, it's like that was quite a moment actually. Yeah. And like, I mean, yeah. So, so like, we're of the of the, the generation where, like, we were at school from from the beginning of school. Like, it was the new South Africa. Like, we we had mixed classes and everything. I mean, like, there was no like, yeah, no institutionalized segregation in the classes. And like, uh, I think that's. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's opened like our generation up a lot more, but very much still in the older generations, it's, it's mm, like it's very much still, still there. Yeah. 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 People with the same language will be friends with people with the same language. Like even you'll find like black people like these different languages that have different cultures, cultures and stuff. So the, uh, the Zulu people will be maybe more friends with the Zulu people, the Kosa people, Kosa people, Peri people, Peri people, Venda people, Venda people. I think in the important senses. Um, a lot hasn't changed. You know, like, what has changed is that there isn't, like, in terms of the law, explicit oppression of, of black people. 
um, or non-white people. But but these other forms of oppression are so much more strong. And so yeah, so obviously certain things have changed, but there's still a long way to go, man. Past rates for a black person applying to a certain degree was so much lower than for a white person to apply. So exactly. So say I got 80 percent for matric. Okay, which is our final grade, and a black person got 60% or 50%. They would rather accept the black person because of BE. Yeah. So I would have to achieve so much more, and I would still not get into the university just because I'm white. So, my friend then said to me when we were talking about this, and he said to me, You know what? At the end of the day, you reap what you sow. And I said to him, But you know what? I don't sow anything. Like, my family didn't sow anything because we've always been kind to people of other colors. He said, It doesn't matter. The Bible says, You sow what you reap, and your, your kind, your color, sow apartheid, so now you're reaping the benefits from it. And we weren't born during apartheid, but we'll, we are still suffering from it. Because it doesn't matter what diploma, degree, experience, or anything I accumulate, I will always not get chosen for position because I'm white. And it's not fair because we did, I was born after apartheid. I remember in grade one, also, this girl came up to me and she was like, well, mommy says I can't play with you. And I remember thinking, whatever, that's your loss. But you know, like as a kid, you didn't. I didn't understand what yeah, that meant. Yeah, you know, yeah, why? Something, why? Yeah. Like, okay, whatever, dude. You don't have to play with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But then also, like when I look back, I'm like, oh, in grade one, it was 1995, which means that we had just switched. You know, we had just segregated, like into mm. you know, schools and stuff. During the apartheid uh, regime, South Africa was very much closed off from the rest of the world and supposedly at, at that point it was more capitalistic than it was going to become once the ANC had gotten into power, the African National Congress. Um, but that wasn't necessarily what's happened. The, the, the countries opened up a significant amount more. Um, so there's incredible opportunities uh, in, in South Africa. And there's incredible, um, far greater openness per se. But I mean, if you, if you look at the, you know, if you look at the 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 the, um, the, the charter, um, it's, it's, it's incredible ideas. My concern is in terms of execution. My concern is in terms of the fact that service delivery is not being met, empty promises are being made. Um, the results uh, just don't speak for themselves. There's kind of a bubbling of unrest um, in South Africa that um, I think people see it every now and then. Um, but and I, th I think it's getting worse and worse slowly. Um, but it's more, it's based more on what sort of, you know, people not having and seeing only a minute, you know, minute part of, you know, the non-white people actually getting to that stage. Um, so, <coughs> saying that, I think it's, you know, the divisions that exist post-apartheid, I think, are largely based um, on, on, on basically po poverty. Um, and that's, I think that's the crux of, I think that's the crux of the racism, I put it in inverted commas, in South Africa um, at the moment, post-apartheid. I think apartheid times, it was always just black versus white. Um, now it's, it's coming to a stage where it's haves versus have-nots. We moved to like a very Dutch area. My mom was saying that even though it was 94, obviously it 
were still fresh. So like we had like Dutch neighbors and they would throw like fireworks in the backyard. Yeah, it's still fresh. It was like still fresh. Why did they choose to to move to like a specifically like a Dutch suburb? Well, the Dutch we were in. Yeah, I'm sure, but like it also it's about like access. You know, like the township we were in. Like this was the township for that suburb. I don't know if you've noticed that that townships are linked to suburbs. Yeah, I suppose it's because of the whole like like um whole work thing. Like yeah, exactly. Every every white household has has a black domestic. Exactly. So that's there'll be like, like an informal yeah. settlement next to that mm. suburb, and that's what the township is basically. Mm. Um, I, I mean, to see, to see like like where, where you really see that segregation is like around uh, Sanson in Joburg. Like it's sure. the most opulent part of South Africa. They yeah. reckon like within the, the four square kilometers there, that they, they have something like 65, 70 percent of South Africa's wealth there. And right next door is probably one of the poorest uh, townships Alex, okay. in, in the whole of or Dipswert. Oh, right. And uh, Alex on and, the and other Alex side. And Alex on the other yeah. side, yeah. So it's really extreme. In Johannesburg, these areas they were just talking about were actually designed to be separated. They built roads around the township so that there is no merging of yeah, the two classes. And rails and all yeah. It's physically built into the society, just, yeah. into yeah. the system. Yeah. From my perspective, it's um, it hasn't even been a very long time, so yes, there has been lots of change. However, um, for applying for jobs and bursaries, there are still some sort of drawbacks where um, specific races get the better job, um, but there are criteria in place like a BEE, so certain companies has to take a specific amount of whites, blacks and coloreds to fill specific positions, so we're getting there. Yes, there is a racial segregation. Uh, in, post, <clears throat> in the olden days, it, it used to be very, very, you know, very, very strong and very, very harsh. At least today, you know, uh, <coughs> there is segregation, but it's not the same like like uh, like yesterday. Yeah? I, I had my my own, you know, sort of um, racist experiences, if I can call it that. You know, I was called kaffir by white kids. You know. Um, hit by, by white kids. I mean, we're probably about, say, 10% black kids in the school, or nine white, nine white kids in the school. Um, but, you know, at, at, at the time, um, what I realized um, as, I, as I went through the school system um, is that you almost had to, I guess as a black person, you almost had to sort of stand out to to not suffer um, you know racism or, or be accepted if I can put it that way um, you know for instance I, mean, I had a, a racist teacher <laughs> I won't mention his name but he was, he was a maths teacher and he'd always you know make comments in class about you know the wonderful days back in Edinburgh when where you don't see these people, you know, he used that to refer to black people, and and he actually, so he actually, you know, made a whole lot of crazy comments. And the craziest one was, so I happened, I was in about when I was say at seven, and I happened to be in his under 14A cricket side, and you know, and, and I think also his under 14 rugby side at that time, and. And I was okay, like I was blessed enough to be decent enough at sport, so, you know, so one day he sits me down and he looks me in the eye and tells me, you know what, Jason, the only black people I like are you, Ahe and Jimmy. You know, and, and I sat back to think and I thought, okay, I'm, Ahe played Natal rugby, Jimmy played Natal cricket. Um, you know, I ended up being pretty decent at sport. Um, so, I, I mean, my experience at, the, at that high school stage was um, I sort of had to excel to be accepted in something, whether it was academically for some people or in the 
arts sport but those uh, sort of the black people that did well at school or were accepted or had a good time at school were the ones that really excelled at something. What I get a lot, and I get this a lot to the point where I've actually started thinking about it, is white people will always say to me, you speak so well. And I'm like, thanks, <laughs> cool, but I can tell that for most of them it's like a surprise, you know, it's like they expect you to have It's like an dot accent, dot dot, or... like you speak so well for a black person, mm. you know what I mean? Because in this country, you can tell the difference between a, a black educated person and a, and a black uneducated person, you know? <laughs> to the point where even uh, they have a name for us, they call us Model C's, you know? Who are you guys? Really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is Model C? You know, when, when apartheid ended, there was the mixed Model schools, C's? they called them Model C schools, yeah. yeah. So, the mixed schools. Yeah, the mixed schools. Oh. Um, but obviously not everyone had like that like access. There the, 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 the were previous white schools. Which, previous which, white which schools. Which were yeah. now mixed schools. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if you come from one of those schools, you end up talking like how I speak. So do you speak that way because of the schooling? Yeah, I do. Does totally. your family speak that way? Too? I have I have parts of my family that speak like me and parts of my family that oh, don't. Okay. Because we because have, have this, had different education schooling system. systems. Mm. Yeah. Like, so my little cousins will only speak Zulu. Um, and I'll speak English to them and it's so blatant like even in my own family system you know there's that difference um, so it's it's become more like a it's social way rather than just a racial thing it, yeah I think it's also just a, an opportunity thing not just a racial mm. thing you know? like, I think that's that's a large part of it yeah. it's like it's it's like where whereas it was divided by race like like institutionally divided by race now that's kind of carried through in, in, in the socio-economic aspect because of that division that happened previously. I mean, that, that's why we have the whole like yeah. um, black economic empowerment, like affirmative action and that sort of mm -hmm. thing, and trying to, to even that out. But like, I think that that's a large part of the reason why there is still so much so much racism. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's sort of like, when you look at different parts of the world, you see like a group of people who are really oppressed for several generations, and then it's, it's tough for them to climb back up from yeah, exactly. It's like the First Nations Aboriginal people in Canada. Mm, yeah. uh, you know, a lot of people will just like, you know, would be so ignorant towards why they suffer and why they're like held back, mm. saying, oh, we give them all these opportunities, but they ignore what happened exactly, for that it's all been those entrenched. years. Yeah. yeah. And obviously that plays a role. Same with like slavery in America. Mm -hmm. A lot of places actually. Like, yeah, look at the Middle East. There's pretty much any country in yeah. the world you can point out, like well, apart from Europe, really. Like yeah. any country that's been colonized, sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. True. I just think it's particularly fresh here. Yeah. It's only been ten years, and the gap isn't big enough yet. Yeah. Yeah. And totally. so the level of education of people in the generations older than us is still very low in in the black and people of color kind of groups. Um, and I really think that the education system is what is leading to a continual cultural divide at the moment. Um, so, so do you think, say like maybe just predicting the future I guess like 20, 30 years from now? I think it will have normalized a little bit more. Eh? Um, yeah. I hope. It takes time. Know, yeah. It does take time. But it, we do forget that it's still fresh, you know, in terms yeah, of, of course. like, if we go back like slavery, apartheid, like these systems have been entrenched. Yeah, you look at, at how like the, the systems of slavery is still affecting like black people in America. Of course, but yeah. I mean, that was how many like I mean two hundred years ago. Sort of I mean thing, like yeah. well, but it happened for four hundred years. Yeah. you know, and yeah. even so, after that, they were not equal. Yeah, you know, it was, that's people are still around. Like civil rights movements were sixties. You know, so it's not it's not that long. Ago. Yeah, so uh, like, slavery ended. But we're still like, not allowed to ride the same bus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like even even when when America had um, like sanctions against South Africa, they they were still like they still had like very yeah, very racist laws problems. in those. Yeah. You know, racism still exists in South Africa. Um, obviously, I think um, people who I guess think that it doesn't um, aren't. You know, I think a bit ignorant or perhaps um, naive or just they don't get to see the other side of life. I mean, you only have to 
drive into Guguletu past Mzolis to see, you know, what reality is for a lot of people. Um, another mechanism that is built in is one that I've experienced at the university. Um, many years ago I applied for medicine and on the application form I had to state my race and along with that went a certain number of points that I needed from a trick. So as a white person I needed, needed let's say, 70 points. As a colored person you needed 60 points. As a black person you needed 50 points. So this is part of their plan to try and get more people of color into the universities. But I don't feel like it's actually succeeding because it's, in the end, it's reducing our level of education and the level of our professionals that are coming out of the universities. One of the, the biggest things we're facing is an inequality. So, yeah. There is a gap between rich and poor. Other people even say economic apartheid is still existing today. Some may even say that there was never the real economic transformation. Uh, it's still like the slave and the master. Unfortunately, the, the education in the townships is not as equal as education in the cities. Uh, and then, because even when apartheid came, it that came with a hierarchy. Yeah. Whereby on top used to be like white people followed by uh, uh, Indians and colors, and then in the last would be black people. And also, the reason for that is because the black people were the majority. Now, automatically, they were the church to the upper the family. So, if they protest, they wanted to make sure that if the majority protests, they wanted to co opt. Indian and the colors, not to forget about the little privileges that they were given. Although they were not like little privileges, it was more of like rule and divide. They wanted to put boundaries between the people so that they don't get along. I think that racism in South Africa in general as a whole is um, it's dying down a little bit. It's, it's only places like Cape Town or the Western Cape rather. And that still, I think, has still got a long way to go and uh, you'd really have to be at the bottom of the food chain to know that.